Welcome back to the Paranorm Girl podcast. I am your host, Kristen. Halloween is almost here. The veil grows thinner as All Hallows' Eve approaches, my little goblins and ghouls. Are you ready? I sure am. I can't wait. This year, I am celebrating my favorite holiday a little bit differently. I've got the regular stuff all squared away. My jack-o'-lanterns have been carved. Ornaments and decorations are set. My offerings to my great, great, great Grandma Rosina are ready to be placed. Honor your ancestors, if you like, or don't. (laughs) Personal preference. But this year, on October 31st, I will be searching for ghosts. No, really, I will. (laughs) I will be returning to St. Ignatius Hospital for a second go, round dos. As a reminder, the first time I visited, a shadow person was seen behind me in the security cameras minutes after I felt nausea in the room from whence it exited. I had my first experience with an undeniable scent of something that really had no place being there. I used a REM pod for the first time, and I had some really interesting things happen with that at one point in the evening. Got totally skeezed out in the nun's quarters, a.k.a. the creepy attic. Nothing paranormal happened up there. I was just more scared of a possible person who had snuck in and was now lying in wait for me somewhere in the dark. Creepy stuff. Uh, it, there were no windows up there. It was it was so dark, suffocatingly cramped. It was just, it, it just made me nervous. But there is so much more to be discovered at this location. From recent research, uh, as I understand it, there is an apparition of the hospital's first patient, a mangled and disfigured man that has been reported. There is a strange green light anomaly seen all throughout the place. And then there is the thing. A large, dark mass. It rushes at you out of nowhere. People report a buzzing. What in the world do y'all think that thing is? Hmm. Now, I have been pretty dang transparent with my listeners since the beginning of this show. Here's a a little more honesty for you. I'd be lying to you now if I said I wasn't a little afraid (laughs) to return to St. Ignatius. I'm only human. I wish I were not afraid, not not human. I'm glad to be human. Whatever. I, I need to embody a little Hans Holzer during this night. He said in all of his years investigating, he was never frightened. I have a quote for you here. Fear is created by not understanding something. You bring on the fear. There is no object to fear. That is what he said, and I believe him, and I agree with him. I'm still afraid. (laughs) But I am also beyond excited to give it another shot, to apply my investigatory skills again on a place I know to be haunted. And this time, I am going armed with new information, baby. Information I have learned about the equipment, about how to properly and safely conduct an investigation about documenting the occurrences, and about how to leave the property without any unseen hitchhikers. And I am going to share all that I have learned with you guys today. So, without further ado, here is your crash course in investigating the paranormal. Ghost Hunting 101. Before you even step foot inside the location, I think it would be important to already be armed with some logic and common sense about what's about to happen. First and foremost, there is a difference, or so I have been informed, between hunting for ghosts and investigating them. If you are ghost hunting, 
you are going to a location specifically to experience an entity or ghostly activity. To experience it. There is nothing wrong with that. It can be a thrilling and memorable night. Fun night. If, however, you are ghost investigating, you are entering a location specifically to collect data and note changes to that data. You are documenting anomalous activity. You are collecting evidence. You are there to investigate a claim. And based on your data points, changes to the data, anomalous activity, and other collected evidence, you may be able to solve the case. You may just get some answers. Next, pareidolia and apophania. You will likely experience both. These are natural human tendencies. We all do it, and there is nothing wrong with you if this happens. However, while investigating, we should be extra mindful of them. Our ancestors evolved these tendencies as survival instincts to help them foresee potential threats and get ready to act on them. Apophania is the tendency to perceive meaningful connections between unrelated things or definite patterns in random information. During your investigation, are you sometimes connecting dots that perhaps shouldn't be connected? Are you putting the cart before the horse? Apophania can also heavily come into play while reviewing EVP evidence. Just something to be aware of. Pareidolia is a form of apophania. Humans are so good at recognizing faces because, guess what? It's another survival tactic. It is instinctual. We cannot help it. Pareidolia is when we see patterns or recognizable shapes in random things, like a bunny in the clouds or a face in the shadows. Something else to be aware of before beginning your investigation. Over the course of the evening, you are likely going to be so bored. <laughs> Seriously. Hours can go by with not a thing happening. They are in complete darkness, but if they had the ability to see, the investigators could literally watch fresh paint dry between hits on their equipment. Just, just the way it is. <laughs> the greatest thing ghost hunting reality TV did was bring interest, enthusiasm, and attention to the world of investigating. The greatest disservice was pushing the lie that haunted places are active from the moment you step foot inside to the moment you leave. Spirits definitely want to interact with you constantly. Demons, oh, they're everywhere. And evidence overfloweth. From my own experience, and from speaking with numerous investigators who have been in the field for 10 plus years, this just usually is not the case. That being said, though, you know, sometimes things do happen. Sometimes you do have an incredibly active night, and that is really exciting. But, you know, just expect the boredom, and then maybe you'll be pleasantly surprised. All right, let's move on to the main event. Your investigation should actually begin well before your scheduled time at the location. You aren't going to have much to go on, especially if this will be your first time at the specific location. Now, I would recommend you beware. Uh, other people might disagree with this, but I say beware of other folks' previous experiences and stories from there. Not that it wouldn't be a, a good idea to know that information. Just be careful not to let that taint your own experiences there. However, you are going to want to research the hell out of the spot. There is no going too far when it comes to researching the history of the building or land. Really important information to take in with you will involve the people who used to live there, who used to own the land. What was their names? Occupations. How many kids did they have? Were they married? How did they die? Also get information on deaths or tragedies in general for the area that could come into play. 
Get as much information about the building as you can. When was it built? Are there deeds? Has it ever been renovated? If it's got a long history, look to see if it was ever used as something else. I recently learned this local storefront that I frequent downtown was the first post office here. So friggin' cool. (laughs) I love that kind of stuff. It also used to have a stairwell right in the middle of the store. It's not there now. I wouldn't, I didn't even know it was a two-story. Someone fell down it back in the day, broke her neck, died there. So that's not fun. But if I were to go in there to investigate, that is a tip I would like to have. It's something to work from. And don't be afraid to go too deep with this stuff. I've gone as far as pulling like original blueprints and old sketches of floor plans. I was glad I did at the time. It was for an office building I was investigating that used to be a funeral home and mortuary. And from the floor plans, I could see that the storage area where they were keeping their files and printing paper used to be a loading dock, I presumed, for receiving bodies. And the room next to it used to have a cleaning station and drain in the floor. At the time I was there, it was being used as their break room. A cleaning station and floor drain uh, paints a picture for me as to what it was, it was originally used for. So you can discover some really interesting stuff that can then be used during the overnight. Do your due diligence. Also, this should go without saying, but, you know, get permission to be there. (laughs) Um, I know a lot of folks got their start by sneaking into abandoned buildings and places maybe they shouldn't have. But I'm just saying um, from a safety standpoint, it's a good idea. Don't don't go getting shot by the landowner who thinks they have an intruder. Don't be falling through rotten floorboards that the homeowner might have told you about had you asked. And, you know, maybe it's abandoned for good reason. Maybe it's infested by hobo spiders or has asbestos in its insulation. The point is, you don't know until you know. And people have gotten hurt or in trouble for trespassing when there was just no need to. There are plenty of really awesome locations you can buy a night to go in, and also plenty of locations where the owner would probably be happy to let you in for free. All right, so the big night has arrived. You have done all the work you needed to leading up to this moment. You are inside the location, and the investigation has commenced. Hopefully, you have given some thought as to your plan of attack for the evening. At this point, many investigators will start the night off with a prayer or something similar for protection and safety. And hopefully, you have given some thought by this point as to what equipment, if any, you will be implementing. Everyone is going to have different opinions about the setup, the methods used, and the equipment. I have gone through everything (laughs) for this episode as carefully as I could as far as why a piece of equipment is theorized to work, why it might be total bunk. For every cynic out there saying that none of it actually works and it's not real science is a theory as to why it actually does work and an amazing story about profound evidence captured That was far beyond just chance and glitch. So I'm sincerely just going to go through the equipment for your own knowledge. I'm going to be listing out as much of it as I can for you guys, but only you can be the judge for yourself if it's worth using and if there's any validity to its usage. Uh, I wanted to start out with some of the more popular, more widely used pieces of equipment first. But before we do that, let's have a little science lesson. A lot of the modern fancier equipment and our theories surrounding ghosts is based on electromagnetic fields and electromagnetic energy. Have you ever mistakenly used these terms along with 
electromagnetic frequency and electromagnetic radiation interchangeably? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> it's totally okay. It's very confusing. So uh, I'm going to give you the the dumbed down version that was given to me in order to understand it so that hopefully we can better understand our equipment and why they do or do not work and whether they can be credible tools to be using. An electromagnetic field, an EMF, is the space around electrically charged objects where both electric and magnetic fields are at play. EMFs are created when there is an electric current or a moving charge. Anything that uses electricity has an electric charge, has an EMF around it. Power lines create very strong EMFs because of the high amount of electricity that they carry. Household appliances, mobile phones, wiring in your house, outlets have them. Natural sources create them too, like the Earth itself has an EMF. The human body also creates EMFs though much weaker compared to, like, outlets and wiring. But the neurons firing in our brain and the beating of our hearts generates tiny electric currents. The fields that we create are so weak, it's unlikely they would be strong enough to create any significant interference with devices that we may be using for investigations to detect fields, but, I mean... You know, still test it out. If your device is sensitive enough, yeah, they could be picked up. That is also something important to consider if you are of the belief that though living humans aren't putting out a strong EMF, spirits would. Just something to think about. All right. The electromagnetic field. When there is motion or oscillation of the electric charges, sends out electromagnetic radiation via waves that travel through space. To simplify, you flip on a light switch. Electric current moves through the wires in alternating directions. It's alternating current. This constant reversal of direction causes that oscillation of the electromagnetic field, which sends out the radiation, waves of energy that move outward. That would be the visible light out of the light bulb. Visible light is electromagnetic radiation. Also, microwaves, gamma rays, x-rays. Also, UV and infrared radiation, too. If you are familiar with investigating, those two come into play quite a bit as well. Electromagnetic energy is the energy that is carried out by the electromagnetic waves, which, depending on how high or low their frequency, will indicate how strong or weak the energy. In ghost investigation, usually we are only ever trying to detect either the electromagnetic field, essentially the source point, or the energy that comes of that field. The theory being that the presence of either would be indicative of something anomalous when there is no other reason for the EMF or energy to be there. I think I got that right. <laughs> um, please understand. I, I, I am not an expert. <laughs> I am a layperson trying to better understand this information so that I can apply a fair skeptical look at ghost hunting equipment. <laughs> you know, the period of time I spent trying to break down the electromagnetic spectrum for myself contained a lot of moments of me going, wait, what? <laughs> but this is as hard as this information is, is going to get today. I, I promise. So long as we understand what can create a field and what creates the energy, I think we can better understand the data that our equipment is giving us. So there's two main genres of equipment that we can utilize. Detection tools versus tools used to record what is being detected. Let's start with EMF detectors. There are tons of variations on the market today. I will just throw out a few that you have probably heard of and then explain the differences. First up, 
the K2 meter. These devices were originally developed to be used by electricians to locate electromagnetic fields coming from faulty wiring and appliances. This device became widely popular after being featured on early ghost hunting TV shows and is, to my knowledge, still the most used piece of equipment out there and the most hated <laughs> by debunkers. It is a small, handheld, simple-to-use tool with a colorful display and LED lights that illuminate when a field is detected. It is theorized that when the needle spikes in an area where there should be no electricity to do so, this may be evidence of something far more anomalous. The underlying theory is that ghosts emit or affect EMFs. And this would be where you question whether or not you think a spirit of someone can give off a more powerful EMF than a living human being does, which, again, is not that much. Your toaster emits a stronger EMF than you do. Melmeters were introduced in 2008, and their invention comes with a rather sad but maybe hopeful story. Gary Galka, its inventor, would lose his daughter in 2004 in the aftermath of a car accident. His daughter's name was Melissa, but they affectionately referred to her as Mel. Story goes that immediately following her death, the family began to experience communication from something unseen that included the doorbell ringing, touching from something unseen, TVs turning on and off, channels changing by themselves, lights being turned on and off. They felt pretty quickly that this was Mel trying to communicate. But at the time, Gary said he didn't know anything about the paranormal or afterlife communications, anything like that. He said that in order to better understand the activity, he began to watch ghost hunting shows and being an electrical engineer, recognized the equipment that they were using was intended for commercial use and for electricians. He put his skills and new knowledge into action uh, about what was needed by paranormal investigators, and he created his basic Mel meter that measured electromagnetic fields and also temperature changes, two and one. Since the creation of the basic meter, Gary has gone on to create far more efficient and advanced versions. Newer models are capable of detecting both alternating current and direct current EMF. Most EMF detectors out there only pick up alternating. Um, sensing thermal infrared variations in the environment. Proximity sensing of a thermal anomaly. Motion detection and can also create its own EMF with sensors that can detect if something is affecting or distorting its field. Gary also created many more instruments to detect paranormal activity. He is also the inventor of the RT-EVP, which is a real-time digital EVP recorder with simultaneous playback and spirit box capability. He also donates much of the proceeds from the sales to charities and groups that benefit grieving parents. So if you're thinking about buying your first piece of equipment, you know, with this one, your money does go to a good cause. The Trifield meter is very sensitive, especially with energies on the lower end of the electromagnetic spectrum. That being the case, this device can pick up energies from your own body to energies across a room, to energies outside the building. <laughs> Take the good with the bad and just be aware of that if you choose to use the Trifield. The great thing about this device is that it is capable of taking readings for three different sources of energy, which include electric fields, magnetic fields, and radio microwave frequency. This device was meant to be used to suss out EMF pollution in an environment like cell tower or uh, mobile phone radiation and appliance emissions, and is sensitive enough to show higher than normal readings so a person can take action to reduce exposure. 
Be aware this device is so sensitive, it can pick up readings of cell towers and power lines from quite a ways away. <laughs> uh, by the way, squirrel, uh, the, the things I, I learn when I'm researching one thing and then it goes off the other. When you are using your microwave, y'all better be standing about 15 feet away. That thing puts out quite a bit of radiation. It's kind of weird that we are uh, that they are still su such popular appliances. You know? They make dinner fast. But at what cost, y'all? At what cost? Uh moving on. Your body will affect a field by being too close to it. So, if you are going to use this device to capture fluctuations and spikes that might indicate paranormal activity, I would suggest setting it somewhere on its own and putting a camera on it. Just don't go near it. Uh, I'm, I'm actually surprised, having gone through different EMF readers, uh, you hear a lot about them. And uh, I thought I was going to hate the K2 quite a bit and love the Trifield because it had so many options and picked up on so much more. But that might actually pose as your problem. Sometimes, especially when ghost investigating, simpler is just better, y'all. And uh, I don't think I mentioned before, but with these devices and most devices to follow, it is of utmost importance, absolutely a must, establish your baseline readings in every room. Get baselines for outside versus inside and if you have the ability to do so, get baselines for different times of the day. That's a lot of work. But if you're really wanting to attack a claimed haunting from as unbiased and scientifically approached as possible, you've got to know if the spikes that you are getting are normal or abnormal for the location. If the same readings are seen during the day as being seen at night when the homeowner says the ghost is active. You've got to know if what you're getting is coming from the neighbor's house. If you don't want to do all the extra work, go ghost hunting instead. I, you will have just as much fun, I promise. PKE meter picks up psychokinetic energies. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> This is, of course, the device from the Ghostbusters. Psychokinetic energy is paranormal theory, and we have no way to measure such signatures. Yet. <laughs> Can't measure them yet, but wouldn't that be nice, right? Um, investigators in the past have also incorporated the use of a Gauss meter. This would narrow down your scope of focus to detection of magnetic fields. That may be important data depending on the other equipment that you may be using, and if you think ghosts are magnetically inclined. I'm not sure. Personally, I have not used one. Rim pods! Yay! Jazz hands. Uh, rim pods were also developed by Gary Galka. These are in this EMF family, but unlike an EMF detector, these create the EMF via an antenna, and then we'll notify you via sounds and LED lights if something disturbs the field it creates. I have had the opportunity to use these now a couple of times and documented some rather interesting activity from them. Now, as I mentioned at the top of the show, I am going to have the opportunity to test my original interaction with this device back at St. Ignatius. I'm going to start with it in the exact same spot. If I get a similar reaction, going to play around with placement and note the distance of anything that could possibly set it off, which is what made it so impressive to me in the first place. Because the building does not have electricity. The closest power lines were 30 to 40 feet away. I was 10 feet away, but I, I, I was just sitting, not moving, nothing. And this thing lit up seemingly in response to my questions. Having had some time to reflect and study on other possible causes for the disturbances that can be seen in the REM pod, I now know things like walkie-talkies being used will set them off easily. Their frequency can fly right through your field and bam, 
you think you're talking to the dead, even from the next room over. I do not recall that anyone in the group spread throughout the building that night had walkies. I just don't. But I will be taking a nice, long, hard look at that possibility. Now, I'd like to address something about REM pods briefly. Skeptics um, often spend a lot more time complaining about the construction and original intended purpose of these devices than they do on why they don't work. Using their simple construction or original job as a springboard to point to its inevitable suckiness as a ghost detector and the reason why it can't possibly provide scientific data. Kenny Biddle uh, wrote up a really excellent piece. Actually, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I've got it down in the in the show notes. Check out the link. But he wrote this piece about why REM pods suck. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 he did just this, he, that this was part of his argument. I appreciate the skepticism, though. I really do. It is needed, necessary. Uh, his recommendation that a Faraday cage is used is a great suggestion, actually. I think more investigators should incorporate one. But if someone's biggest complaint about a REM pod is that it's a repurposed theremin. I mean, most ghost hunting equipment exists because it was repurposed from something quite normal to detect paranormal activity, to test the theory that ghosts are energy-based. And this, it's repurposed, therefore it's shite argument is often thrown out there, and I personally don't see any merit to it. Just because something was originally designed to detect electromagnetic pollution coming from bad wiring doesn't automatically exclude it from also being able to detect it coming from an entity that is theorized to be creating or affecting that same energy. Two things can be true. <laughs> All right. Um, let's move on to the other end of the equipment spectrum. Detecting fields that shouldn't be there and interruptions to those fields that have no easy explanation is awesome. It is only one side of the story. We need to capture the evidence. Many a young fascination and lifelong pursuit for answers to the afterlife mystery has been launched with a ghostly whisper captured on tape. Electronic voice phenomena. Debunkers of EVP regard them to be nothing more than hoaxing and or auditory pareidolia. I think many EVPs can be debunked as this and as hoaxing. However, many cannot because they are clearly the voice and words of someone. And many times a person has captured them while alone in the space they were recording. EVP is often described as brief, usually no more than a word or short phrase. I have heard full sentences before. They are often described as muffled, mumbled, barely above a whisper. I have personally heard some pretty clear ones from speaking voice levels to yelling, the whole spectrum. EVP can be captured on digital recorders, which is the preferred method in our modern world, it's cheaper, easier, more accessible. Some investigators swear by analog recording, though. That's, that's your old school cassette tape and player for my younger audience. It's thought analog can capture subtle variations and due to its white noise inherent in the recording might actually make it easier for faint voices to be captured in the static or to use that energy to imprint their words on. It's also more difficult to manipulate recordings captured on cassette. With digital, you do have access to advanced filtering capabilities, easy playback, higher fidelity, and it is far easier to analyze and edit the files, though unlike analog, so friggin' easy to manipulate dudes. So dang easy. So 
if you choose to use digital. That's fine. Most people do. Just be honest. <laughs> don't mess with the final file. Don't add. Don't take anything away. All that jazz. Uh, all EVPs are going to fall on a scale from Class A to Class C. C is the hardest to hear, hardest to understand, usually a whisper, grunt, mumble of something. But there's still some communication believed to be on the recording. Class A is the holy grail. It is clear, easy to understand. Often it is intelligent response. Often it is a longer phrase or sentence. When others you share the recording with understand it, are hearing what, what you heard, you don't need to adjust levels during the playback, you probably have a Class A EVP and should give yourself a, a nice pat on the back. Good work. <laughs> if you would like to play around with capturing EVPs, but you don't have anything to record with, yes, you do. Open up that phone in your pocket and pull up your voice memo app. Boom. Digital recorder. Now, EVPs are barely to never heard by our ears alone in real time, hence electronic voice phenomenon, and why it is so important to carefully go through every minute of file following an investigation. This can be incredibly time-consuming and frustrating if you wind up with nothing to show for it. However, there are tools that can be used to hear a ghost as they are speaking. The spirit box is based on the theory that ghosts can manipulate radio frequencies. In doing so, they may be able to communicate in real time. The spirit box works by scanning through radio frequencies, which produces a stream of static and fragments of audio. The user has the device on and scanning while they ask questions and hopefully receive answers by the spirits who are manipulating the frequencies to land on certain words, phrases, or even strung together words from consecutive channel hits to form a full sentence. In 2002, Frank Sumption, who was already a fan of electronic voice phenomena, would be the first person to communicate with spirits in real time via electronic equipment when he developed Frank's Mox. This device utilized a modified radio receiver to sweep through frequencies in order to allow spirits something to manipulate in order to get a message through. There's a really neat video on YouTube of Frank sharing an example and stories of communications that he felt he had received from his deceased son. Said it sounded like him and everything. Uh, Frank would only create 180 of these devices at the time. But since the introduction of Frank's box, numerous variations and improvements emerged and became commercially available. A very popular model is the SB7. I have gotten to uh, speak with many investigators about this device, and based on those discussions, you either love them or you hate them. <laughs> the, the biggest complaint by users of the spirit box is the irritating static. That is my biggest complaint, too. We have so much in common. <laughs> it just makes it very difficult to hear any words coming through it. And, and then the, the static just grates on my nerves in general. But fear not, fearless ones. There are accessories you can purchase that can be used with your spirit box in order to reduce the headache inducement and more clearly bring forth the communication called a spirit portal. There are a few variations of these as well, but all of them seem to provide the same effect, just in different sizes. A very popular method of communication that incorporates the spirit box is called the Estes method. This is where a sitter has the S box hooked up to soundproof headphones and is wearing a blindfold. The headphones and blindfold is to reduce external stimuli that might affect what they say. Um, they then simply call out whatever they hear through the device 
All the while, an investigator is asking questions of the ghost who, in theory, is manipulating the spirit box. I've heard some pretty interesting conversations taking place during Estes sessions. Another device. This one is highly debated, but let's talk about it. The Ovilus, created by Bill Chapel. If the REM pod and K2 meters drive debunkers to the brink, the Ovilus, go and push them over the edge. Okay. <laughs> right over the edge. Uh, the Ovilus is a pretty simple concept. It contains a database of words, and based on readings it takes of electromagnetic fields and temperatures, it gives you the word that corresponds to that combination. I actually do not have an issue with the basics of how this thing is said to work. This object is based on the theory ghosts are made of and can affect energy, just like most of the rest of the investigation equipment that is available. The only issue I would have with it right at the start is that someone had to program the combinations of temperature and EMF to the corresponding response. Someone had to presume that a three-point spike on the EMF and a, a drop of 10 degrees equals the word murder, right? Yeah. Skeptics have brought up also that because the database is limited and can never give you new words that aren't already included, it's never not going to give you dramatic responses and can't give you reliable, relevant communication. However, this device has come a long way in offering more substantial and wider ranging information in its database. The developer says now, and since the earliest versions, the Ovilus does not use random word generation. It is, in fact, based on those environmental readings. The latest version now includes eight modes, ways of communicating, that include the regular dictionary mode with a database containing 2,048 words. If you are curious what words are uh, in the Ovilus are included in the Ovilus. Um, Bill Chapel does include the list already for the public to check out on his website. I, I really appreciate the transparency. Draw mode, which is what it sounds like, gives you drawings based on readings. Energy mode, which will read static and EMF. Log mode, which is just a memory history mode of things that the Ovilus has already said, and you can look back on. Motion mode. The website says this mode is good for watching for footsteps or something touching the device as it helps you visualize vibration. Not quite sure I understand that one, but I, I mean, I, I get the concept. Uh, phonetic mode. The words created in this mode are not necessarily already programmed in, as this mode forms words in phoneme chunks, just pieces of words, creates new words. True-false mode, no explanation needed, I don't think. And proximity modes, sensors, respond to EMF and static electricity around you and shows you where the source of that is in proximity to yourself. People have referred to the Ovilus as a speak and spell for ghosts. And that is, is actually true to some extent. If you believe the ghosts are affecting the changes in those environments that the device is using to choose the words that it displays. But unlike the speak and spell, again, there's no random word generation taking place. And the Ovilus, according to its developer, is not based off of a, a pre-programmed gaming system like those toys of old. <laughs> Any of my listeners have a speak and spell when they were a kid? Those were uh, a little before my time. Not, not too far before, but a couple of years. Let's move on to devices used for visual evidence captures. Then we will close today out with a segment we're going to call the Island of Misfit Ghost Hunting Toys. 
Capturing ghosts on film has a very long history. Since the birth of both movie and still cameras, we have attempted to capture the likeness of spirits. We have done it for entertainment purposes. Some have used people's desire to believe it could be done to perpetrate hoaxes for profit. Boo! But countless folks have also captured what they truly believe to be actual evidence, photographic proof of unseen entities and anomalies. Whether shooting on digital or film camera doesn't seem to matter. Things not seen by the naked eye can be and are picked up, but there are pros and cons to the different formats. Let's talk about that. Advantages of shooting on digital. It is less expensive, more accessible, and easier to use for the average user. Results are quick. You will have the ability to view photos and footage instantly, allowing investigators to assess captured anomalies on site at the moment of capture. This ability will also allow them to adjust settings and angles accordingly. Digital cameras have a high sensitivity to light, making them a great way to shoot in darker environments and even darker environments if the camera has infrared or full spectrum modifications and filters. If you, like many investigators, believe ghosts exist or can manifest in the infrared or UV parts of the light spectrum, which the human eye cannot perceive, you're going to want to have these modifications and accessories at the ready anyway. So, yeah, pop them on the camera and forget about it. Uh, digital is easier to manipulate, unfortunately. Much like digital audio, files are. Many investigators like to uh, skip the skepticism and doubt from viewers of their work and just use film to begin with. Hopefully, they also just prefer to use film. Many investigators do, believing film has a higher dynamic range than digital, meaning it can potentially capture greater detail and therefore would make it easier to pick up less obvious details of apparitions or shadows, but without all of the fluff that digital is going to throw at you with its high light sensitivity, like unnecessary dust particles, bugs, moisture droplets in the air. Quick note about that. Fans of orb photos. I have seen different sources say to provide extra light to dark environs and add a flash if you are on the hunt for orbs. Flash is literally going to get you everything that is in the air. If you are a lover and believer in orbs on film, maybe it is time for heads to be put together to come up with a different way to get their photograph because as it stands, it's easily debunkable. Disadvantages to using film? Annie up. It's going to cost you. Uh, you also do not have immediate access to the capture. In fact, you, you're going to be waiting because it has to be developed. And beware, though film is harder to manipulate, things can still happen in the development process that could ruin your potential evidence like exposure to light, scratching, uh, and oopsie with the chemicals, that kind of stuff. FLIR cameras can be used in complete darkness. This is a thermal imaging camera that detects infrared radiation, heat, or lack thereof, and converts it to a visual image that we can see. FLIRs have high sensitivity to temperature shifts. And though in their real-world military and law enforcement applications, they would be used for sussing out hidden heat signatures of living bodies lying in wait, in ghost theory, the FLIR's ability to indicate extreme cold spots, not what it was built for, is an advantage. That can also indicate natural factors too, though, so be logical and thoroughly investigate what else it could be that you are picking up. What, what, what's, what's creating the cold spot? All right. Last camera I want to mention. Structured light sensor cameras, SLS cameras. These are so popular 
due to their use on ghost hunting programs. And they are just fun to use. <laughs> are they worth the hype, though? I'm surprised to say that, yeah, I actually think they might be, if you know how to properly use them and can disregard false positives, and if you know how they actually work. The SLS camera is repurposed technology to find ghosts. Surprise! <laughs> Shocker, right? Jokes aside, uh, this repurposing really does make sense, dudes. And I think uh, it helps to support the theory that ghosts do create cold spots and temperature drops. And I will get to why in just a second. Skeptical argument number one. If the SLS is detecting and picking up on infrared readings, then you should be able to see the ghost standing there with your separate regular infrared camera. Why can't you? So the technology behind the SLS camera was originally developed by Microsoft for Xbox 360 Connect. The original purpose was to allow players to interact with video games without a physical controller, instead using their body movements and gestures to control the game. This technology uses a combination of an infrared projector to shoot out thousands of tiny invisible infrared dots into a space and an infrared camera and sensor to capture any distortion of these dots and process them to create a 3D model. Its software analyzes this data to detect depth differences in a space and any human-like shapes when that is detected. It applies a stick figure over the shape and will follow joint points and movement of the shape. The SLS camera does detect infrared, yes, but its own that is being reflected back to it once it maps the space. The ghost, in this case, doesn't have anything to do with infrared energies. It, it, it's just creating 3D depth in the space as the infrared dots hit it. Skeptical argument number two. False positives are common, and that figure you see is just a chair. SLS figures have been captured dancing, walking, crawling, and physically responding to commands. If chairs and other inanimate objects are doing that, we have a much bigger problem on our hands than ghosts. Same goes for reflections and software glitches and user-created shadows. These can and do create false positives. Very true. But do they wave at you when asked to do so? False positives can easily be sussed out investigators, it falls on you to analyze and interpret what you're getting. Be logical. Don't read into or play into it. And at the end, if you're getting something intelligent, then, I mean, that's, that's what you're getting. Okay? Skeptical argument number three. The infrared dots need something to reflect off of in order to map a figure in the first place. If no material form is there, what is creating the distortion in the grid? Well, this is a good question. And my answer is speculative, but theoretically possible. First, colder surfaces more easily reflect IR light, whereas warm surfaces absorb and emit it out as a thermal signature. That is how FLIR cameras work. That's what they pick up on. Colder surfaces more easily reflect this light. I mention this because the cold part of this equation would correspond with the belief in the paranormal world that ghosts cause cold spots and temperature drops. But a cold spot, cold air in itself, would not be enough to create a figure. It needs to be accompanied by material or a material change. Like mist, denser air, and depending on their structure and arrangement in the air, molecules. If the speculation were true that entities can alter 
or manipulate energy in an area, a material change to the air is theoretically possible, and that is how a human form might be detected. Can a ghost gather and manipulate enough energy to manifest enough material, even if it is invisible to our naked eye, to be detected by the SLS camera? Many believe so. Let's talk about our straggling band of misfits, our grab bag of stuff some investigators carry in their toolkits. I'm really just going to go through these quickly for your information. If you have never heard of or thought about these items in a paranormal sense, you can do a little deeper dive. DVR system. This one was one of the top recommendations from an investigator friend of mine. Hadn't thought about how important and convenient that could be during an investigation when you've got multiple cameras running. Laser grid. Uh, I have not played around much with these. They're cool looking. These are shown onto a wall or other surface and left in place. This tool would be used to detect movement or changes in an area that might otherwise go unnoticed. Motion detectors. I would recommend you grab a couple of these. Set them up all over your location. Don't you worry when it goes off at 2 a.m. in the dark, scary basement. Be brave. Go check it out. Or just, you know, go send Aaron down there. Cat balls. These are motion activated. Folks use them for real-time communication. An 800-year-old ghost from the Middle Ages might not find these amusing, so, you know, know your audience. Um, also be aware, the slightest vibration can set these off. So stop moving. Stop it. You know what I'm talking about. Stop it. Black lights might come in handy. These are not to detect the ghost, but to gather additional context for the haunting, possibly. It can pick up handprints, footprints, hidden symbols, bodily fluids, ew, uh, maybe messages written from the beyond that our eyeballs might miss. Black lights are also useful to reveal hoaxing or tampering with evidence in a reported haunting. Are you being played? You can find out. Dowsing rods. Helpful in finding water, in theory. Also communicating with ghosts, in theory. <laughs> the movement of dowsing rods is logically explained by the idiomotor effect, which is unconscious small movements we all make without realizing it. Same concept with the Ouija board. But there might be something more to it than that. If you tuned into my spectral short series this summer, you may have caught the awesome story from a woman who communicated with her deceased father using dowsing rods and, with his help, figured out the passcode to his phone that contained sentimental photos and videos that only he had. This was after multiple attempts on her part, trying to guess the code and getting locked out over and over again. The dowsing rods communicated to her the correct passcode, and she got access. The odds of her success were 1 in 11 million. Dudes. Crazy odds. <laughs> Uh-oh. Ghost hunting apps. <laughs> There's plenty of support and disagreement on uh, the validity of these programs. I feel like, look, a, a ghost either can or cannot manipulate energy. If they can, then what makes a K2 meter any better or more credible than the EMF reader on your phone? Also, and this goes for every single thing that we have covered today, this is my own opinion here, but y'all do not take any one piece of equipment's word for it. If you are not getting detection readings, spikes on more than one tool. If you cannot support the capture on one device without also getting something to back that up on another, that is still something to document, for sure. 
but shouldn't be taken as the gospel truth. Because in theory, you should be able to, right? That's the deal. So if you capture a word on your phone app and then are also able to detect a form on the SLS or you got an EVP or snapped a photo with a shadow figure in it, then who cares if you use the phone app? It's just an additional tool. Use them or don't. You know, personal preference. Uh, oh, also, if you don't already know this, if you are going to use an app, be sure your phone is in airplane mode so you are not setting off your EMF devices. And final piece of equipment, a digital thermometer, because, bro, duh, that is going to come in handy to confirm the cold spot or sudden drop in temperature that you feel, okay? Uh, I would like to include an addendum to our crazy long list today. Y'all gonna be dragging your ghost hunting kits in with you, they so heavy. Here is a list of things to take with you on any investigation that people might not think about beforehand. Extra clothing for when you get cold. Something else for when you get wet. First aid supplies. Safety first, but you know, band-aids for after. Paper and something to write with. You are going to be documenting everything. Everything. Feelings you had, temperature drops, shadow out of the corner of your eye. Note the time, who else was with you, if anyone else experienced it, if it was detected on a device, etc., etc. Food and drink. <laughs> Average investigations take anywhere from six to eight hours. Take some sustenance. Extra batteries. You can't have enough batteries. These things can drain like crazy, y'all. And walkie-talkies, mind the REM pod. Congratulations, you have now reached the end of your investigation. You have one final task to perform that most investigators would recommend you do. Kind of falls in the same category as saying goodbye at the end of your Ouija board session. My understanding is that there is no one standard thing to say. But in whatever way you feel comfortable, you may want to communicate to the spirits of the location that they are not welcome to follow you home, unless that is something you want. I have spoken with a few folks who were happy to have the ghost tag along, go live with them. <laughs> That's not, that life ain't for me. Uh, I'm not telling you one thing is right over another, but uh, you know what? I will give you a, a cautionary tale to consider. I was at an undisclosed location last year. We ended up wrapping it early for a few reasons, but part of our reasoning was that nothing was happening. We weren't getting anything on the devices. No weird feelings that couldn't be explained outside of creep factor. No temperature drops that couldn't be explained. It was, in short, kind of boring. So, we wrapped up after only three hours. My assumption that since there uh, was nothing of note that had happened equaled no ghosts or weird energies was what I quickly understood was an assumption made in error. We packed everything up, said goodbye to our contact, and we left. As soon as we hit the road, I experienced a sudden onset of just a terrible, terrible headache. So bad, I couldn't think clearly. Didn't want to speak. It hurt so bad. I think I've mentioned this on the show in the past, but I do not often get headaches. It's a rarity. This headache began strong and grew in intensity the longer I drove. It finally started to subside a few minutes from my house about a half hour later. It was very strong, very sudden, and very quick. I could not explain it, but I, I didn't think much about it once it disappeared. Over the course of the following week, we began to review our audio and video. 
And this is how I know I am not a psychic or medium. So much evidence, dudes, (laughs) so much took place in the span of just those three hours that I had zero clue about during the actual investigation. Anomalies, thumps, some of the clearest EVPs I have captured to date. I am going to play two pieces of evidence for you guys right now that is from that location. World premiere. Now, I'm not going to front load you on any of this evidence. Um, I don't like to do that. I don't like it when people do it to me. But I will tell you just for context where this took place and uh, what I was doing, if I was doing anything. Uh, So this first EVP I will play for you took place near the end of the night. Uh, This was down in the maintenance room. It's where an old boiler used to be in uh, the janitor's hung out for the building. So I will play that for you right now. Now, the second piece of evidence, second EVP, this took place right at the end of our night. We were leaving the maintenance area, and I was locking up, and we were getting ready to go back upstairs and pack up everything and leave. Whoa. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Now, I think I know what is being said. Again, I'm not going to tell you. Instead, I would love to know what you guys heard. Do I have a couple of intelligent captures on my hands or no? Um, Am I just uh, having a bout with auditory pareidolia? Message me at paranormgirlpod at gmail.com. Let me know what you hear. Please let me know. Now, all of that being said, even if you think there is no activity, no haunting taking place, this doesn't mean there isn't. Had I considered at the time that things were happening that I just wasn't noticing, wasn't hearing, and just put some trust in the technologies I had brought with me, maybe I could have foregone the headache entirely by taking caution and, in a sense, closed out my session at the end of the night. I could have foregone some strange electrical malfunctions at home in the weeks that followed that uh, investigation, too. Uh, As I recall, I wrote those off as nothing at the time. (laughs) I just wasn't thinking about it. Uh, Maybe it's all just coincidence, you know. But still, if I could go back and do it again, I would have ended the night a little differently. That's all I got for you today. Join me for a final note. In the early 1900s, Harry Price laid down the framework for the scientifically approached paranormal investigation. He created a how-to handbook and introduced the Ghost Hunter's Kit to the world, a practical toolkit with essential items to document findings without overcomplicating things. Wonderful and marvelous at the time, simple compared to today's standards. I don't know about you guys, but I was a bit overwhelmed (laughs) by today's dive. So many things to remember, so many choices. It is easy to get lost in the whirlwind 
of options and opinions. This was a tough one to get out. Not gonna lie. Hence why it's coming at y'all a few days late. But instead of getting overwhelmed and seeing stars over all the must-haves and ooh-la-la gadgetry and gizmos, remember there's nothing wrong with going back to basics. Pull a Harry Price and take only what you need in with you. Don't let a bunch of beeps and LED lights get in the way of your wonder and awe at the mystery. Don't let the excessive amount of choices or other opinions throw you off the scent of why you started investigating in the first place. Investigators catching this one. What is your go-to piece of equipment? What can you not leave home without? And why? Holla at your paranorm girl and get you and your group a shout out on the show. Follow and message me on social, any social, at Paranorm Girl Pod. I'm pretty easy to find. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube and click the notify button so you never miss the visual versions of these episodes. And I believe I did fail to mention last week, but the show now has a spooky storyline. Leave your name, where your story took place, and then tell your story. Just call back if you need more time. 208-717-1655. Listener stories will be featured on an upcoming episode. Join me next time for a discussion about a rather incredible and not all that well-known poltergeist case that took place back in the 80s in Poland. I will be speaking with the translator who brought that case to the English-speaking world, Joel Stern. Don't miss it. Going to be an awesome chat. That is a wrap for now. See you guys next time. Stay safe, keep the nightlight on, and sleep with one eye open. Have you ever wanted to learn a new language? Maybe you were inspired by a recent international trip, became obsessed with a foreign film or TV show, wanted to communicate better with a loved one, or just felt like developing a new skill. With Rosetta Stone, learning a new language is easier than you thought. Rosetta Stone has been a trusted expert for 30 years with millions of users and 25 languages offered, including Spanish, French, Japanese, Dutch, and more. Learning is immersive and designed for long-term retention, so you fully learn to speak, listen, and even think in that language. Don't put off learning that language. There's no better time than right now to get started. Listeners can get Rosetta Stone's lifetime membership for 50% off. Visit rosettastone.com today. That's 50% off unlimited access to 25 language courses for the rest of your life. Redeem your 50% off at rosettastone.com slash today.